All right, while you guys are entering that, uh, I just wanna kind of explain a little bit more about what we're all doing here. Uh, the goal of Mountaineering Month is to connect people with skills and education about being outside. Uh, last night we had Chelsea Murphy. Thanks for being with us again here, Chelsea. Uh, she explained a great presentation about what it was like to further uh, equity in the outdoors. And so we're really excited to, we were excited to have her yesterday and we're really excited to continue that today. All right, I'm just going to peek at the chat box. Let's see, where is it coldest? Looks like so far Estes Park is the coldest. We might be winning all of you snowbirds or uh, warm weather people in Texas and Arizona. <laughs> awesome. So last night we heard from Chelsea and she gave us some great actionable steps on how to make people of color feel welcome in the outdoors. Um, and tonight we're gonna hear from Len Nessifer, who's joining us from Arizona where he's a professor of American Indian studies at the University of Arizona. He's also a member of the Navajo Nation and CEO and founder of an outdoor apparel company based in Colorado called Natives Outdoors. And I think in his former life somewhere, he was an engineer. Is that right, Len? Yep. So, <laughs> so the topic of today's program is to learn how we can all be better partners with indigenous people and do a better job of respecting and honoring native communities. And I think everybody's here on this call because they really have an attachment to the mountains and especially the Rocky Mountains. And I think we all have an obligation to understand Native people's relationship and history with this land and, you know, figure out what kind of questions we should be asking when we look to understand the cultural history of this area. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Len Nessifer. Right on. Thanks to you. Uh, I'm really sad I couldn't be there in person, but I'm, I'm going to be getting my uh, next, my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine here soon. So had to stick back for that. Um, so, but anyways, I'm really excited to be here. I've um, had many chances to spend time in Estes Park. It's one of my favorite places in Colorado. Um, you know, the backcountry skiing, of course, is awesome. The climbing's amazing. So it's just really a place that's held, a, you know, a really special place in my heart. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about where we're going to go today. It's going to be a fun little adventure, but um, part of where I really began in talking about Indigenous peoples is giving some context and how we got here, then the long history that precedes the landscapes that we now recreate in, spend time in, or, you know, live on. Um, so we'll be taking a step back 3,000 years and very quickly going into the present and understanding how our public land system um, and our reservation system coincide with each other. Um, there's a very deep connection between Indigenous removal and the creation of our federal land system. Um, I'll then move into that, chat about that, and then talk about the work that I've been doing in, in rewriting Indigenous stories and my own story into the landscapes through recreation. Um, so a lot of uh, uh, hanging from rocks and climbing down uh, or skiing down steep couloirs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of to break the stereotype that Indigenous peoples are antiquated, we're stuck in the past, and like, you know, in many ways, we exist and live in the same uh, in a sort of environment as everyone else, and we're adapting these sports for our own uses. Um, so let me let me go ahead and share my screen with y'all. So one of the places that we really have to start is before what what happened before 1492. Um, 1492 was of course the when Columbus landed in the Caribbean, a little bit disoriented, a little bit lost. Um, but that particular period of contact marked a fairly um, brutal history that followed for the, the next few hundred years. But I think it's important to understand the peoples and cultures that lived here prior. Um, there's a lot of evidence pointing to human occupation of North America dating back as far as 20,000 years ago. Um, and in places like Colorado, you know, we're looking at 12 to 10,000 years of human occupation um, within that area. And as you can imagine, it's, you know, quite a long time. Um, you know, this, our country is only what, 220, 240 years old. I mean, it's, 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 we're looking at a fairly long connection that indigenous peoples have had with these landscapes. So this is a framework I like to use in sort of understanding the peoples and cultures that existed, that still exist and existed pre-contact and the civilizations that were there. There's three lenses that we can look at this is first is scale. 
you know, are we looking at a large civilization or a small hunter-gatherer bands? And there's sort of a spectrum in between those two. The second is what kind of economic foundation um, existed? You know, many indigenous peoples and cultures existed, you know, as trade economies long before, um, you know, pre-contact. And, and I'll give some examples of what that looked like, but, um, and then we can start taking a step down the line from looking at sort of more dispersed agricultural societies um, to more, um, I would say, hunter gatherers, you know, moving on a predefined circuit, um, gathering food and living a life based off the land. In many ways, these things were really dictated by the environments in which indigenous peoples lived. Um, and the last is this social structure, you know, did we have centralized power? empires, that sort of arrangement, or more of the semi-nomadic decentralized power structures. And to that point I made earlier, a lot of these were dictated by the carrying capacity of the environments, existing trade networks, and a variety of other factors that were there. I think the important thing to note is that the sophistication of these societies, I wouldn't say larger is not always better or more sophisticated. I would say in many instances, even the smaller societies are more sophisticated in the very niche adaptations that they've made to these environments. So the first, we'll kind of walk through what this looks like first. So the first is um, these large trading empires. Um, so these are societies like the Incas, the Olmecs, the Maya, the ancestral Pueblo and the Aztecs and the Mississippian cultures that we found in, in the United States. These were generally societies that had large urban centers. Um, and I'll show you an example of one particular city that was actually much larger than Paris in the 1500s. Um, and then, um, and then in, in some other examples of the use of, of different technologies by these societies. This is, um, this is a lot to read. I don't, the, the point of this particular site is that it's important to note that, you know, 2,500 years ago, 5,000 years ago, there was indigenous societies and civilizations that existed in this continent. This is from Central America, which is really where we see some of the largest civilizations um, within the Americas, but you can see that there's a ton of overlap in different parts of Mexico and basically the existence of these societies that basically long predate um, first contact and in, in civilization. So Mexico, I highly recommend going there. It's an amazing place. But the first of these, um, one of the ones that is just an amazing society are the Olmecs. The Olmecs lived um, and their descendants can still continue to live in the central part of Mexico along the Caribbean coast. This part of the world is incredibly flat. Um, it's highly vegetated with jungle terrain. Um, but one of the things is that this particular place was a cradle of civilization, of the Olmec civilization for close to 2000 years. Um, one of their notable traits is that they carved these large statues that you can see here out of volcanic rock. Um, and these, these particular um, statues, you know, could have been reused for religious purposes or other sorts of societal purposes, but you go through central Mexico and you still see these um, um, artifacts there. One of the things that is really amazing about this part of the world is that 2000, over 2000 years ago, um, the Olmecs, because it was so flat, because water sources were so far from agricultural areas and from cities, they began developing um, aqueducts aqueduct systems to move water from the highlands into these areas. And that's in large part how they were able to thrive. The other element of this is that they also developed sewage systems as well using the same technology. Over 2000 years ago, running water, pretty amazing. Taking another step, another example, looking at these large societies. This is from Palenque, Chiapas, Mexico. Highly recommend once COVID is a little bit more under control. But this is one of the largest cities um, in pre-contact America. Um, there's still hundreds of acres that are still being enshrouded, um, basically um, entombed within the jungle. But these are some of the major um, uh, structures that were built. And the important thing to note is that these particular structures took a lot of engineering. They were over you know, 2,000 years old, um, and they're still standing. Um, you can basically imagine, would your house still be standing after 2,000 years? I don't know. Um, but this really points to the engineering and technological prowess that these societies had and also complicated understandings of mathematics and physics. One of the, one of the things that I always like to reference is that, you know, in, in our society today, we have a base 10 counting system. 
the Mayans had a base 20 system. And, um, you know, this, this was largely based upon the, you know, uh, 20 fingers and toes. Um, but, you know, this was in many ways, this was their sort of numerical system that they used in developing these, um, these, these, these amazing structures. The next, if we go a little bit further south into South America, of course, this is like one of the most iconic um, photos of Machu Picchu. Um, but it's also in many ways, the pinnacle of, of um, engineering prowess of these societies at the time. This was largely a um, sort of a palace, uh, Camp David or a, you know, a real swank Airbnb, <laughs> whatever you wanna call it, but it was for the royalty. This particular area had um, running water up on this, on this, um, on this, uh, this pretty large mountain. Um, and one of the things that was particularly notable about Peru is that you basically find these, um, you know, as we find in Colorado, these incredibly wet areas in the mountains that hold large snowpacks and then very dry areas, um, basically lowland steppes. And, and the, uh, the, the Incans basically developed um, amazingly long um, aqueduct systems to move this water as well. And as you can see, there's this, there's this thread of, you know, moving water and, and basically being able to develop societies that were able to thrive in many areas that might not have a stable water source. Um, this is always a really fun slide. <laughs> I, uh, on the left is, is, is an example of the Mayans or the Incans and their um, sort of understanding of, of stone masonry. Um, you know, many of these uh, crevices of the rocks on the left, you can't actually stick a piece of paper in. They're so finely cut. Um, and they're so, I mean, there's a really deep understanding of one, how to cut these rocks. That takes quite a lot of understanding and also a, quite a deep understanding of geometry and mathematics as well. And as the Spaniards came in, you can see they kind of cobbled something together on the right. But this is always a fun thing. If you ever go to Cusco in, in um, Peru, this is a place um, you know, all the tourists or the tour guides will show you these sorts of interfaces between the Spanish and, and the Incans, and it's a point of pride, rightfully so. Um, and these walls have survived many earthquakes, um, and they still stand today. Of course, um, this is right outside of Mexico City, the Aztecs, in many ways building upon the societies of the, the Olmecs and the Mayans. Um, this, you know, if you ever go to Mexico City, this is right on the outskirts, but these are just some of the examples of these large structures in South America. An important thing to note, though, is that this also exists here in the United States. Um, there's earthen mounds and large structures that were built in um, places like Iowa, in yeah, Illinois, Ohio. Um, you know, these societies were large and they basically were connected through trade networks. This is Cahokia. Um, this is uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site actually located about 15 minutes outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you can see I-70 running on just on the north side of that mound right there. There's the, uh, the lake and right in between the lake and the forest is a large interstate, I-70, right? Um, but this particular site of Cahokia was um, in around 1500 was the largest city in the world. It had Basically more people lived here than did in any other European city um, at the time. Um, it was large, it was very hierarchical. There was, there was large you know, sort of ceremonial practices that occurred here. An important thing to note though, is that trade was an essential part of the society here. Um, there's evidence of, uh, of trade between South America and also here in Cahokia as well. Um, Highly recommend going. It's kind of a trip because there's like an oil refinery right, right next to it, but that, that aside. Um, and right in our backyard, um, the ancestral Puebloan people, um, this is, I, I mean, I would say indirectly, I'm a descendant of these people through my Navajo heritage. We had, we basically intermarried with some Hopis at some point. Um, but this, this history of these particular people is long and, um, um, basically, you can still see the, re the evidence of this within the state of Colorado. This is, of course, um, uh, Mesa Verde. And, um, you know, this is, you know, one of the many structures that were built towards the latter end of this large civilization. Places like Chaco Canyon um, in New Mexico, again, another UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, you know, many of these larger cities often served how we think of cities today. You know, these social, cultural, and religious centers. Um, 
Chaco Canyon in particular was connected to Mesa Verde, both by trade routes and also through a very interesting uh, network of um, century towers that would basically, uh, you know, effectively send uh, the equivalent of Morse code. And so back in, back in those times, a message could be sent from southeastern Utah and the Bears Ears region to Chaco Canyon in less than an hour using these, um, you know, strategically placed century stations. Um, even within Chaco, there's evidence of trade um, and also really interesting stuff as like um, uh, chocolate and live parrots and things of that sort. I'll get into that in a second. So we take a step down, taking the next look at this. Um, we have the smaller societies, I would say the more agricultural based societies. So the Navajo, the Hopi and the Pueblos are kind of within this. Navajos would kind of border this sort of, we straddle the hunter gatherer agricultural side of this, but I'll get into that in a little bit. But the descendants of the ancestral Puebloan people, um, you know, are understood to be the Hopis and the Pueblos of New Mexico. And today, you know, in many ways they have lived in uh, much the same way that they have for centuries. Um, you know, these, these two village sites of Hopi have been occupied for at least uh, 800 years. Um, Oribe is one of the lo longest and in continually inhabited uh, uh, cities or villages within the United States. Um, but one of the things is that, you know, often what you see in these particular societies is that they're much more distributed. Um, there's a lot more uh, sort of decentralization of power that occurs. So each of these villages have their own councils and things of that sort. So the tops of each of these peaks, they have their own, they have their own village and religious structure or their governance and relig religious structure as well. Um, of course, the Taos Pueblo, this is one of the, this is the longest inhabited um, building within, within the United States. It was first built in about 1250 AD and people still live there today. Um, it's an amazing place. Um, once COVID's over, highly recommend checking it out. Um, but it, it really, what I'm, the point is here is that there's a longstanding relationship that indigenous peoples have with these places. So we'll take a step down. Um, here in the Sonoran Desert, the Tana Atam people, and the Navajo kind of occupy this, what I would call this semi-nomadic structure. Um, so what that means is basically we try to use and adapt the environment given the constraints that are, uh, face us. So down here in the Sonoran Desert, you know, it's not a, the best idea to spend uh, the summers down here uh, in, the, in the valley floor. If you can get up a little higher, you'll generally find a little bit more favorable um, living conditions and food sources. So my my people, the Diné Navajo, we live a semi-nomadic lifestyle. And in, in part, this is because uh, um, of the introduction of sheep. Um, so sheep, of course, are not uh, something that we have always had. It was introduced by the Spanish, but this had a fairly large shift in how we related to landscapes. So th what this meant for my life was um, this two camp system. We had a summer camp and a winter camp. This is an example of a summer camp in the Chuscas. So every year we would move <laughs> a few hundred sheep, a bunch of kids would move a few hundred sheep, you know, 20 miles and 3000 feet up a mountain. Um, and it was always that time where, you know, my, my uncle and grandpa would give us a hundred dollar bill and let us go in the grocery store and get whatever snacks we wanted because <laughs> we had a whole day of suffering ahead of us. Um, but, you know, in many ways, the reason why we did this was because just, you know, 3,000 feet higher above us, it was 15 degrees cooler. Um, we had much more steady sources of water. The sheep, more importantly, had grass to eat. Um, and as it got colder, we would move it down. And what you see in a lot of these societies is that you see it's a much more distributed power structure, governance structure as well. Um, and lastly, is these less permanent structures. And so, you know, many societies have lived in this manner. The Ute, for example, also lived this way, but basically building structures that would, you know, easy to construct um, and basically adapted for the environment. So this is called a cha'o, but this is, cha this is an example of like a shade structure that you would use during the summer. Um, you know, not long standing, you can easily dismantle it and, you know, weather and elements can get to it. But the point is, is that it allowed for flexibility should environmental conditions changed, which especially in the desert happens quite a lot. So the point is, is that as we start moving down this structure, we start to see more and more decentralized um, forms of government. So moving away from these large urban centers to maybe like uh, family or linguistic cultures to bands and individual families. 
And the last, um, what we'll, we'll talk about here is um, this more of the hunter-gatherer societies. And in, in these particular um, societies, you generally find in places where um, it's, I would say the environment is much more stark. Um, you know, places like uh, Alaska or the northern reaches of Canada. One of the places where I've been able to spend a bit of time is in um, up in a uh, town that used to be called Barrow, but it's called Utkiavik now, um, which is the Inupiaq name. Um, it's uh, basically a couple hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it's 24 hours of light, it's 24 hours of dark, you know, different points of the year. But one of the important things is that this particular part of the world, you know, on, on first glance seems uh, harsh and inhospitable, but it's one of the places that people have lived the longest in North America. Point Hope, for example, is the longest and in continuously inhabited um, uh, location in, in North America, dating back 12,000 years, and there's still people that live there. Pre-contact, uh, much of the diet of this part of the world is like 98% um, sea mammals. Um, and other sorts of birds, you know, there's very few vegetables, but when anthropologists started coming in the early 19th, the early 19th century, they started, they were finding that folks in this part of the world were living, um, they were some of the longest living people in the world. And that was both the combination of diets that were high in very healthy fats, and also a diet that was, uh, or a lifestyle that was very based in movement. This was, uh, this was from a, um, uh, this is called the messenger's feast, but this happens around this time of year, but it's you know a huge whaling festival that happens in that part of the world. Um, one of the things that I always like to point out, this is an amazing, amazing piece, is just how adapted these societies were and the technologies that they were they developed. So on the left, you can basically see as a parka. Um, this was made from the intestines of a whale. And why the intestines of a whale? Well, because they're it's very waterproof and it's also very light. Um, and um, this was much of the, an example of some of the equipment that folks would use when they would go out on the ocean. Of course, snowshoes, um, glacier goggles, and on the bottom right is an example of what we now know as crampons. So just some examples of how those translate today. Um, you know, the, much of these technologies were adapted for um, movement through these landscapes and um, basically being able to maximize um, in large part hunting <laughs> in this part of the world. And, you know, we're talking about how cold it is. I think in, in Fort Yukon, the place I've spent a lot of time, it's like negative 40 this time of year. So, uh, but it's actually the best time to go because it's the easiest, easiest time to move around. Everyone's hanging out at home. Um, and the last is, you know, this is a, this is a little trip that I did um, a few years ago um, with some descendants of Chief Joseph, who's a well-known Nez Perce chief, but we went down into these canyons and tried to sort of live, reenact sort of the ways in which the Nez Pierce moved from the canyons to the mountains. Really amazing trip. Um, we basically went down with, I think each of us had like one or one or two cliff bars and we were there for a week and we were just eating the food from the land. And it was really, I was, you know, I brought a little bit more food than what they told me to because I didn't really trust them because <laughs> I just didn't feel safe, you know, but they, they knew what they were doing and we ate well, we were eating trout from the river and things of that sort. But this is an example of another society that lived in a very similar way here in the lower 48. Um, so we'll wrap this up, section up and talking about trade routes. This is always one that I, um, you know, people are moving long before um, horses and before um, cars and trains and of course, and you know, these trade routes, um, basically we can see the extension of these all the way from Alaska, all the way down into South America. People and goods were moving um, long ago. You can see there on the in the center and in, in Center of America, you, you see the Cahokia as well. Um, these are some of the trade routes here regionally. So this is zooming in a little bit more. Um, of course, there's you know places like Ch Chaco and and Pecos and, and those sorts of areas. But you can see that these networks extended far and long. Um, so the way that played out in Navajo in our Navajo society is that we have and use abalone shells in our ceremonies, which come from, of course, the California coast. Um, and down here in, in Southern Arizona, in the Casa Grande, that also extended to things like cultural practices and sports. Um, so there's a, there's a Incan, or not Incan, um, an Aztec ball court um, that's actually, that was built here um, in Casa Grande, which is about between Phoenix and Tucson. But there was also the, the exchange of, of things like sport as well. Bulk, um, 
these ball courts were a pretty brutal game. You can look it up on your own. <laughs> People died if they lost. Um, but one of the ways in which you can also trace these trade routes is through the movement of corn. Uh, um, so corn started as what we now know as teosinte, which is this grain that we see on the left. Um, but through selective breeding, um, we began to see both um, specialization of the corn and, and uses of different, you know, basically the, the, the generation of different um, species. Um, and this is an, an important thing to note about corn is that the corn we have today cannot grow without human intervention. It does not grow in the wild. So what that means is that we can basically trace the movement of people and goods through the, the movement of corn. Corn originated in um, Central America and moved its way out. So you can also find corn all the way up into Canada dating back five, 600 years ago. Um, there, was a, there was an article that I read a couple of years, or not a couple of years ago, a couple months ago about um, quinoa being found in an archeological site within Quebec. So, you know, people were, people and goods were moving and these knowledge sets and things were moving as well. And corn is obviously one of the coolest ones that I've, I love this, I love this particular story. Um, in Chaco Canyon, um, you know, there's vessels that were used for ceremonial chocolate um, on the right. Um, and you can see that on the left, these are, these are vessels that come from, um, uh, the Mayan and Aztec peoples. So there was both a trading of culture and goods as well. And lastly, um, you know, one of them, one of the, one of the cool stories that still exists today is that within the Hopi peoples, there's still a parrot clan. And they're like, what is a parrot doing in Northern Arizona? Uh, well, parrots were actually brought up live from um, Mexico and they were used in ceremonial purposes. And so in a lot of ancestral Puebloan sites and especially places like Chaco Canyon, there's been, um, you know, basically the, the uh, remains of parrots found within these sites. So moving parrots, moving goods, like very much how we do today. Um, one of the ideas here is like, did this happen because, you know, languages and peoples, you know, there's a variety of peoples and languages here. This is an example of um, my people, we come from the Athabascan language family, so we're related to a lot of the indigenous peoples within Alaska, um, linguistically. Um, and, you know, the question here is, did we, did this, did this language spread because of trade or migration? In our creation story, it happened because of migration. We came into the Southwest around 1500 and proceeded to get into many battles with the Puebloan people. That's on the site. But within, if you look in the places like the Tana Atham, um, uh, the in other indigenous peoples within Mexico, the Ute, for example, are also a part of this. Um, you basically see um, the language family coming from the south. And this coincides with some of the Hopi stories about how they came to the Americas on a boat and they came north. So interesting aside. Um, so uh, taking shifting gears really quickly. Um, you know, one of the things that I always like to reference is that there's this long history that inhabits our public lands, thousands and thousands of years of history, cultures, knowledge sets. And when we start talking about public lands and specifically wilderness, you see this sort of erasure happening of that. And, you know, that's very reminiscent of a settler colonial society um, and this sort of replacement that happens. So I'll briefly talk about some of this, um, but also just how there's this sort of disjointedness of the narratives that you see within national parks and then also these long histories that coincide with them. So maybe, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's a number of federal agencies that um, manage our federal lands. Um, of course, the Department of the Interior being the largest and the US Department of Agriculture. Um, the, each of these agencies have different missions um, and different mandates, um, of course. Um, but this history of how we got here to our public lands is fairly brutal. Um, these are looking at our um, federal lands today. Much of them are in the West. Um, and in large part, this was because of things like forced removal. Um, so how do we get here? In large part, um, we can trace this back to some of these beliefs around uh, manifest destiny and westward expansion. Some of these things that we've, I mean, we've all learned about to varying degrees within our education system. Um, but one of the things that began happening is that there was a number of federal, um, federal statutes and things related to homesteading that began creating a large desire for Indian lands. Um, 
And what we began seeing is that more and more indigenous peoples began being displaced from their lands um, over from the, all the way from the 1830s. Um, all, as recently as, as 1924, there was actually a battle between the Apaches and uh, the US, US Army down here in Arizona. So this is fairly recent history. Um, and the important thing to note is that in many regards, this was due to um, what we see as the battles that happened between tribes and native peoples in the West. Um, there was, you know, in many regards, native peoples were seen as problems, um, problems that meant to be resolved. And so what we began, began implementing in places like California, for example, um, was what we now define as acts of genocide. The first um, civilian governor of California, for example, ran specifically on a platform of Indian genocide and he won. And so what then began happening was a fairly systemic effort um, to eradicate native peoples and to move them off coveted lands and things of that sort. Um, one of the other factors that if you're really interested in learning about is in the Southwest was the role of Indian slavery. So in the United States, Indian slavery rivaled that of African slavery up until um, uh, the mid 1850s or so. But there was a large demand for um, free labor in Mexico um, for silver mines and, and house labor and things of that sort. Important thing to note is that indigenous peoples enslaved in the East enslaved Africans as well. And they also enslaved other indigenous peoples. And in the Southwest, the um, Comanche were actually one of the largest laborers as well. And they became incredibly powerful and rich as a result of it. So this, ha this, is this history, if you wanna get into that, is there's a book called The Other Slavery um, by Andres Resendez. It's really great, um, but it just really complicates this history of what that looks like. So back to where we're going. And when we talk about this uninhabited wilderness myth, you know, and part of this westward expansion was built upon in many ways an idea that there was land that hadn't been, um, you know, touched or exploited or basically impacted by human contact. And as we saw in that previous section, of course, indigenous peoples have been here for thousands of years. We've had a connection there. So, you know, on first glance, you can see that there's a little bit of disjointment that happens between this idea of an unpeopled wilderness um, and, and the landscapes that we now have today. Um, but in many ways, if you wanna get in deeper, there's this book called Dispossessing the Wilderness, but it gets into this understanding with the, you know, sort of this European romanticism, romanticism about people and nature being separate and incompatible. Um, but what we began seeing in the 1870s through the passage of things like the Organic Act, which creates our, you know, sort of the first iterations of our public lands and national parks was the codification of these beliefs of you know basically um, uninhabited wildernesses um, and these places uh, that were basically called pleasuring grounds for people that were devoid of human occupation. Um, one of the folks that was in this as well was just you know in the turn of the century with the creation of our national parks, um, you know very much building upon this belief of, of people and, and nature being incompatible. This also further extended to indigenous peoples as well. Um, Native peoples were often defined and characterized as subhuman, um, which in many ways is, is sort of the sort of the glide path for genocide. Because if you can dehumanize people, it makes it much easier to eradicate them. Um, but at the turn of the around 1900, there was a, such a catastrophic decline of indigenous peoples that there was a widespread belief that Native peoples were going to go extinct, and um, so in the removal of indigenous peoples and also the signing of hundreds of Indian treaties, you see the creation of this reservation system. And in large part, this was to create a legal and physical barrier between indigenous peoples and the more coveted land that was wanted by settlers. Um, and the other, the other belief about reservation systems is that it could create an opportunity for one, native peoples to either have a smooth descent into the grave or to further be assimilated. Um, and in many ways, we saw this continue all the way up until as recently as the 1950s and 60s through the things such as termination and other sorts of things that tried to dilute Indian land holdings. These are very recent histories. Um, one, one of the things I always like to point out about Teddy Roosevelt is that there is an element of race in this. And there was also the element of racism 
in in the justification for the creation of national parks. Um, you know, this is Teddy Roosevelt's own words. Um, but you know, one of the things is that in many ways this has formed the backbone of our of our federal land system and private land ownership that we have in this country today as well. Um, doesn't mean it's all it's all for naught, but you know, it's it's an important to understand how we got here. So one of the ways that, you know, just to point this out of how this happened is, you know, this is an example of the Organic Act of 1916. This is what created what we now know as our national park system. Um, this is just a quick quote. I think the, the big point and takeaway of this particular slide is, you know, there was a lot of concessions made for resource extraction and other sorts of commercial use, but within no mention of this, our act and creation of our national park system was there mention of native and native peoples or the connections that they have to these places in many, in many regards, um, in all, well, across the board in this point in time, native peoples were shut out both by legislation and by law. Um, and so we see this basically occurring in the 1916. And then reinforcing this myth further of, of a wilderness was of course the Wilderness Act. You know, this, this, rein, this reinforcement of this idea that there is an unpeopled landscape and that, you know, there's places that have been untouched by man, blah, 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 blah. Um, and what we see further is that there's this erasure that happens of indigenous peoples. So just note that that's, that's kind of where we're at today. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to point out about Rocky Mountain National Park with Anestis is that there's, you know, archeological sites right off the trail road dating back thousands of years. Um, but, you know, where are the, where are the signs in, in sort of education pointing to such that these places, um, you know, have long been inhabited and used by indigenous peoples. It's a result of policy and policies can change. And these things, you know, I would, I imagine under this administration might um, veer more towards that, but we shall see. So <laughs> one of the, let's, let's take a little bit of a more positive turn. It's important to know that, you know, in, in learning this history, it's hard, it's challenging, but, you know, there's ways in which that these things are changing. Um, you know, I've, you know, in, I basically had to go to grad school to learn a lot of this history about public lands I didn't know beforehand. Um, uh, but one of the things that was very clear is that, you know, we have two centuries of policies that have attempted to remove indigenous peoples um, from landscapes, both in terms of what is taught and the common consciousness of these places, but also just literally the cultural and linguistic and traditions um, that we've carried for millennia. Um, this has been done through things like boarding schools and things of that sort. My connection to that sort of history is my mom went to an Indian boarding school. Um, and you know, you can, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, you can understand why that's there. But one of the things that I wanted to do in creating Natives Outdoors, our company was in, in large part helping to rewrite these stories, re write a different story as well, maybe a next chapter of what that looks like. And so that's been, I've been doing that through um, adventure sports and storytelling. One of the, one of the stories that I'll point you to, um, if you're interested in reading is in Climbing Magazine last year, I wrote this piece. Um, about Kochi Stronghold, which is about an hour and a half um, east of, of here in Tucson. It's a place that the Shirakawa Apache um, outran the U.S. Calvary for about um, nine months. And if you see this mountain range, it's only about four or five miles across and about 10 miles long. It's incredibly rugged and it's an amazing place for climbing today. But one of the things that we wanted to do in, in telling this story was to tell the story of Aaron Mike, who's one of our climbing athletes for Natives Outdoors. He's also a climbing guide in this area. Um, the Apache and the Navajos were related, were related peoples, both by language and culture. Um, and so in a way it's for us to, um, it's, an, it's a way for us to reconnect with this place. So this was on the morning, um, we climbed out of this um, pretty big wall um, on this 510. Um, really amazing sunrise, but this is, a, this is the Sheep's Head Dome. Um, it's about eight, nine hundred, eight or nine hundred feet. I don't remember, eight hundred feet um, up on the left. Um, but what we were doing in this story is we we're trying to, you know, how we were trying to sh demonstrate how the Shirakawa Apache were able to evade ten thousand U.S. cavalry for nine months in this landscape, and in part, this was done through deep in a deep knowledge of the places that they were living in. Um, we don't know if they, they, they probably weren't rope climbing, but they were probably free soloing stuff to get out of, you know, out of the Calvary's way. 
So we went up this face and we just decided it would be a great idea to go sleep on the fifth pitch, which has this pretty large ledge, um, which you saw here. Um, it was an amazing night. Uh, I didn't sleep very well. This is my first time sleeping on a wall like this. So I just, I don't know, <laughs> it takes some practice. Um, but it was an amazing climb up. We, we got, we basically finished the last pitch in darkness, but then the next morning we had an amazing um, finish up this other sort of out of the right side of the view of this, this, this particular shot. But this was the, that night, you know, just completely frazzled. I've never done anything this big, um, but it was something that, you know, and Aaron and his understanding of this place is so deeply ingrained. Um, and we kept asking along this trip, you know, we began to understand how the Shirakawa Apache were able to evade capture for this long, is just knowing this place. Um, the next day, or two days after we made that climb, we went off to the east side and um, we climbed this uh, um, this route. It's a very, I wouldn't say very easy, it's a five, six route, but it's, you know, just sort of, it's a classic. It's, it goes up this huge face, fairly easy climbing. It's called What's My Line, but we were, um, you know, going up this face as well. And, and we were trying to shoot for this particular photo here. So you can see Aaron um, on the face there. We'll zoom in a little bit more. Um, but he's that little guy on the wall and I'm belaying him and a puffy down in that little crevice on the right. Um, but man, we froze that day. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty amazing. But one of the things that was really notable about this particular um, route is that along the way there was um, grinding holes and matates and things that like the Apache had used to, you know, to grind up acorns to make food um, and also petroglyphs as well. So the evidence of folks being here was as longstanding as well. So this kind of gives you a view of what that particular route looks like. It was pretty fun, chicken head highway, uh, fairly easy. It's like climbing a ladder. Um, so we've done that with climbing and one of the other areas that we've been working with this as well is through skiing. Um, Skiing is kind of a, um, you know, if we look at the origins of skiing, you know, there's there's archaeological evidence showing that it dates back at least to 6,000 years to indigenous peoples in Western China, specifically hunters. Um, and so for us adopting and using this tool in large part is just to more deeply connect us to our landscape. So this is Connor Ryan. He's one of our ski athletes currently um, making a movie with Cody Townsend, who's a big, um, well-known skier, but anyways, our this particular trip is is the time that we went and skied the northernmost Navajo peak called Debenitsa, which is located right outside of Durango. So of course we, you know, it was sort of mid-May. We're looking at these lines, and things are slowly starting to melt out. Um, but what was really awesome about this particular journey is that you know just two years ago, Aaron in the back didn't know didn't know how to ski. He was a rollerblader, so he picked it up quick. And then Connor um, has basically dedicated his life to the professional ski route. And so we um, met up um, mid-COVID because we had to do an exchange for of masks and hand sanitizer that we were get, uh, distributing out to our communities. Um, and we figured we'd turn it into a little ski adventure. So um, this is Aaron's first couloir. <laughs> this is a pretty big, you know, steep day. It's 45 degrees and, um, you know, just don't want to fall. Um, and then on the way down, you know, what was really, really amazing about this trip is that we just thought we're going to get all kinds of media. We're going to do all sorts of things. And we put up this drone and, you know, we're, as we're flying the drone out, we see this huge golden eagle just going straight for it. Next thing you know, this golden eagle just like clips off one of the um, one of the rotors and you know this thing crashes into the wall and we were we were really scared it was a scary cooler to begin with and we're like oh man this is a sign from <laughs> the holy people that they don't want us here we need to like chill out and, um so you know it's a pretty scary <laughs> it was a pretty funny time you know it's like and, and so anyways we ended up skiing down um but you know in part that's 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 what the cooler looked like but in part, you know, one of the things that we wanted to write about this particular place is that, you know, this is a landscape that we've hold, held sacred for a long time. And the way in which we spend time out in these places is by being in, in the intensity of it. Um, you know, in many ways, it's empowering for us as people and where we come from, because um, in many ways we've been told we're not capable of doing these things. Um, but in many regards, it's just an opportunity for us just to relate to these places and tells different stories about this as well. So 
I think we have 10 minutes left, but yeah, that's that's my uh, fire hose for, for y'all to drink from. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks, Len. Um, I'd love for people, if you have any questions, to put it in the chat box, and hopefully we have some time here to answer some of those questions. Um, I guess, Len, could you tell us a little bit more about what Natives Outdoors does and kind of the mission behind that organization? Yeah, so we, uh, we've been evolving quite a bit. Um, you know, we said we are an apparel company. I would say that we're not so much that anymore because we're learning that it's really expensive to do that. Um, but in large part, we kind of focus in three areas. We do um, consulting with outdoor companies on indigenous stories or designs and things like that. Um, we also do um, things like this, like media and storytelling creation. We've made a couple movies. Um, and more broadly, I mean, I would say like generally at the end of the day, we just try to create a pathway and, and pipeline for native talent, um, both on the athletic side, the photography and storytelling side, and then also designers. So we work really heavily in that. And so where that takes us has been ski films, climbing films, that sort of thing. And then also just written pieces as well. And then also we're doing some work with a number of outdoor companies on addressing some of the challenges that they have with cultural appropriation. And we're doing that through one, like giving them um, designs that they can use and then creating better business practices there as well. So we're a lot of different things, um, but that's kind of where we're trending. We've only been around since 2017, so fairly recent. <laughs> That's awesome. And what kind of um, native communities are you, do you work with? I mean, are you very like with Navajo specific or obviously you mentioned just even so many in America alone, what, what sort of interaction do you have between different tribes and, and cultures? So our team has uh, members from several different tribes and largely Navajo because Navajo is the largest tribe. So there's just a lot of us. <laughs> um, so we we try to we try to chill out how many Navajo folks we bring on board because we you know trying to have more representative folks there. But you know I would say generally what we try to focus on is is folks that are passionate about what they're doing. Um, they're very talented athletically or otherwise, and um, you know and then we just try to match them up with opportunities or funding or you know mentorship or you know whatever it is that they need in order to take what they want to do to the next level. Um, so our athlete Connor just got brought on as an athlete for Solomon, which is like, I guess, one of the largest ski apparel companies out there. Um, but, you know, that's a that's a first in many ways for his tribe. He's he's Lakota Sioux. And um, but, you know, for him, it's like he sees that as an opportunity to be a role model for his community. So we just see that as an opportunity to invest in him. Awesome. All right, a few questions coming in. First, how do we recreate respectfully on historically native lands? I think just doing, you know, just doing the homework about who's there um, or who's lived there, maybe the issues that surround, you know, native peoples and their representation there. Um, I, I saw Tommy call, <laughs> Tommy ask that, but, you know, one of the things is that, you know, one of the things that Tommy and I have chatted about is Bears Ears, which is a place that is significant to five tribes and it's a place that I've spent a lot of time, but there's, you know, one, a lot of natural resource issues there with tribes, archeological theft, um, and, you know, other things that concern tribes as well. And I think that's, I would say the first step is just doing that homework. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there. And um, yeah, I would say like dispossessing the wilderness is a great, is a great one to look at if you're interested in the, in the public land side of it. Great. I feel like we have a lot of notes to take on the resources you've recommended so far, but can you list some of the other movies you have made and how we can find them? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to drop those in the chat. So there's two. Um, we've direct directed and funded one. This is the Welcome to Guichage. It's about the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we made it two years ago. Um, but it's about what's going on up there in the refuge. Um, and then the other is, uh, uh, let me see. We made this, we helped Cody Townsend make this ski film about um, Moa, um, this classic ski descent that Connor and I skied off this mountain in Moab with him. 
Um, but those are the two, I would say the two larger ones. And then Tommy and Tommy Caldwell and Sasha G. Julian, we made a small one as well um, and partnered on that. Let me see if I can find that. But yeah, those are, the, those are I would be say the three that kind of sh best shows the work that we do. Awesome. All right. There's a question here specifically about YMCA of the Rockies, and it says, how should Y of the Rockies exhibit the flint making site on the Y grounds? And maybe Dean, if you feel comfortable expanding on that at all for some context, because I don't know that Len is familiar with that specific site. Can you hear us, Dean? Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, it just made me think when, when you're making a presentation that, that indigenous people did come up in the summers in, in these valleys. And we have an archeological site on the Y grounds where there's evidence of flint making as far as I know. And we've done a little bit to kind of make that history um, available to people. Um, but I don't, I don't know whether we're doing it in a way that, that would be respectful. That's all. Mm. Mm. Uh, are there any sort of obvious guidelines when you come across an indigenous site? Julie. Yeah, I, I would say the first place I would go is that like the Arapaho, the Arapaho and you definitely were in that area. Those tribes have um, uh, tribal historic presence officers that can field those questions and like definitely are the points of contact for how to manage that um, and I would defer to them but you know on on terms of how they want that handled um, and they, they deal with that a lot so it's something that they're, they're very familiar with but yeah I mean I think that you know basically a lot of archaeological sites if they sit on private land are are, are at the most in danger of damage um, um, anything that you know disturbs soil basically um, can damage that site as well. But if you're if you've already taken efforts to like um, mitigate soil disturbance, then I think that will go a long way. And then the education part of that, you know, I think that'll that'll something that I would say the tribes will definitely have a lot more insight on how to best prevent that. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right, another question here: How are the Hopi and the Navajo related? Uh, linguistically, we're not, we come, so we, the Navajo peoples moved into the Southwest around 14 or 1500 AD from the North. Um, so just an aside, I spent a lot of the time in interior Alaska and in one of my previous jobs with the Gwich'in and, you know, I hear the language there and it sounds so much like Navajo and we have a few words that are very similar, like fish and other sorts of things. <laughs> it's just kind of a funny thing, but we came into the Southwest, um, and there was a lot of, you know, there was trading, there was warfare, there was strife, there was, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, like any sorts of peoples, there was, you know, conflict and cooperation that occurred. Um, but over time, you know, that what happened was that there was, there was a quite a bit of intermarriage that occurred. Um, so my particular clan, the the tobacco, the tobacco people, the te, there was the Tachini, sorry, the tobacco clan of the Tachini people. Our origin is, you know, there's a there's an or, there's a uh, archaeological site, a ruin, a kiva near Holbrook, Arizona. Yeah, Holbrook, and um, that's where, you know, basically in 1250 AD, that's when our clan came into existence. And um, you know, the reason why we ended up, you know, the the Hopi peoples that then became Navajo was because there was the Spanish were enslaving a lot of Hopi and Puebloan people and there was a Pueblo revolt that happened and then the, the Spanish came back and when the Spanish came back there was a village that um, Christianized and um, the other villages didn't take kindly to that given what had happened in decades before so they literally killed every one of the men in the village and all the women and older folks and children fled and they ended up moving in with Navajo folks and so that's how that's how we became <laughs> related. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it's kind of one of those just complicated pieces of that history there. All right, cool. Um, do you know the language and do you use it often, Navajo language? Did you grow up learning it? Um, 
Yeah, so I learned, I went to an in immersion high school, so it wasn't something that I learned as a child, um, in part because it was policy, federal policy for a long time. So I mentioned my mom went to a boarding school, like if you, some of you aren't familiar, you know, the purpose of those boarding schools was to strip Native folks of culture and language and that sort of thing, and, and to a large degree, it was fairly successful. So that meant, you know, my mom speaking Navajo would get beat by a nun or something like that. And um, so that meant that, you know, my generation were doing a lot to try to learn, um, but it's it's an uphill battle because you know, Navajo is not an easy language. Um, but, you know, I went to an immersion high school and I was able to, you know, there was this moment in which, you know, I didn't speak Navajo. And then after three, four years, I could have a conversation with my grandparents because my grandparents didn't speak Navajo or didn't speak English. Um, so, you know, that's, and then, you know, with my mom, it's kind of like we use a hybrid of English and Navajo. So it's a mix. All right, another question here. What do you want to see from national parks or YMCAs on their grounds as far as land acknowledgement? And what does a proper land acknowledgement look like to you? Oof. Um, I, think, um, I think I would almost step that back further and just say like, you know, there's a number of tribes have treaty agreements that were signed with the federal government. In most cases, they were broken by the federal government. And so I think, one of those, especially in national parks, is that, you know, um, with the exception of Alaska, and Native peoples can't hunt or perform, you know, uh, collect medicinal herbs to, you know, the degrees in which they were able to. Um, and in many regards, that severed a lot of relationships of indigenous peoples to these places. Um, that's a, obviously a controversial one, but you know, the, 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 the important thing is, is that, you know, in many respects, like, we have to look at where, you know, what were the agreements that were signed between Native peoples and the federal government? And like, I think upholding those is key. Um, and when that comes to private land and like say YMCA land, that's of course different. Um, you know, I always say like those are federal lands questions when it comes to private land. I think really one of the things is just, um, you know, having those dialogues and conversations with the tribes that have been in that area. Um, and, you know, in many regards, they'll be the best knowledge keepers of how to do that and the ways in which they want to see that. And I've seen that happen in, you know, many instances, you know, tribes, when they have folks approaching them about what do we do, you know, kind of coming from this place of wanting to do better, they're psyched. <laughs> so um, I would say I would almost defer to them on what that should look like. Cool. All right, would Native Outdoors do hands-on educational events, like how to construct one of those temporary outdoor structures and in ways that are culturally respectful? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we just did it over the week. We made a temporary structure. I don't know, I mean, it was just, we were on a bike packing trip, so we just, yeah, I thought we would do it. Yeah, I guess it would, you know, the intended audience and what's the purpose and trying to figure it out there. Um, you know, I think that's the, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I do a lot on my trips with folks is, um, you know, trying to show the traditional foods and like how people lived in these parts of the world. So especially in, um, you know, in the Sonoran Desert, it's pretty harsh, but, you know, folks are like, how did people live here? You know, <laughs> you know, I've done a lot to try to educate myself about how to, you know, steward the resources out there, but also what's edible foods and things of that sort. And that's just, that opens up a whole different lens on the landscape. And I think that sort of, um, I've seen those as being very successful. So yes, um, and it depends where, but yeah. Awesome. I read an article about how a visitor center at the Grand Canyon is being remodeled with the consultation and input from native people to better tell the history of the Grand Canyon. Do you see that happening at other national parks in the future? I think so. Um, Deb Holland, who's uh, Laguna Pueblo is probably going to be our secretary of interior and I could see that happening. I would almost say like we should take that a step further. Like Bears Ears was an example of kind of where we're headed is co-management. Um, so basically tribes and native peoples, uh, tribes and natives peoples having equal voting and veto power over management of national parks alongside the park service. Um, it's not, it's not unprecedented. There's, you know, it happens in New Zealand and it happens in Canada um, and there's models of how it's been done. Um, and, you know, I always say it's like, why, why shout out the folks that have lived here for thousands of years <laughs> about how to manage it? I mean, it's like, there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, but I think one of the things is, especially in that discussion is that it's, it, 
there, I think Bears Ears, the Bears Ears National Monument in Utah will be the first that comes back and it will be a test case for what that could look like. One thing you said in one of your videos, Len, was how leave no trace applies to cultural history as well, which I thought was a great analogy. I don't think it's something we think about when we think about leave no trace. All right, another mm -hmm. question. Do you think it's best to keep sensitive archeological site secret or is education and protection the answer? I think it depends. Um, you know, of course there's a lot of sites that get a lot of traffic. Like there's, you know, of course sites within Rocky Mountain, Mountain National Park that just really can't handle a lot of visitation. Um, but I think in those instances, they definitely should be kept secret. And I think at the end of the day, it really depends on the tribe and the people that people that built that, you know, they, I would say they should be the ones that dictate what that looks like. Um, you know, in places like Bears Ears, you know, there's, there's, you know, um, village sites that were completely looted and, you know, basically completely trampled. And, you know, it's like the damage has been done. And I think that's kind of an example of where, you know, visitation and public visitation is fine because it's like, you know, what, I mean, aside from completely destroying it, that's a different story. Um, but I think the other is, you know, I think in the leave no trace discussion, like that's kind of a discussion, you mentioned that earlier, but that's, um, you know, in looking at archeological resources, you know, it's, it, or cultural resources isn't just like archeological sites, it's the plants and animals too. Like native peoples have, you know, ties to medicinal plants or other sorts of things that grow in these areas. And, you know, large visitation can trample those as well. Um, and I think that's kind of something that, you know, um, I don't know. I, I just, I think about when I was with my grandfather and we would, he was a medicine man. We'd go out collecting plants. Like we weren't abiding by you know, trace principles in some ways, but you know, it was very, we had our own principles in which we d did it. It wasn't like we were just trampling over everything. It was very deliberate. It was just different. Um, and I think that's kind of where, you know, it really depends on the landscape and where it's happening because it's so eco-region specific in many regards. Awesome. All right, Paige wants to know, her son Gus wants to know which program you use to make this presentation. I made it in Keynote, Mac application. Nice. All right, last question, unless anybody else has another one in the next few minutes, are there any current policies being proposed that we should be aware of to support? Ooh. Um... Let me think. I did, I could have answered that a week ago, but my mind just got completely wiped <laughs> the past week. I would say um, a lot of the rulemaking right now that's happening in um, the current administration is undoing what happened in the past administration um, through the Congressional Review Act and, and reviewing those sorts of things. Um, I think the one, um, the one piece of legislation that I would or Supreme Court case that was decided in July was McGirt versus Oklahoma. Um, this is when half of Oklahoma <laughs> was basically said it's an Indian reservation. Um, that's going to have rippling effects across the board because really what at the end of the day McGirt versus Oklahoma was about criminal uh, juris or criminal prosecution jurisdiction over between the state of Oklahoma and the tribes. And basically the state of Oklahoma tried to charge this Indian, this Creek Indian member for a pretty heinous crime. And he basically said the state doesn't have any jurisdiction here because this land was promised to us in a treaty and that treaty was never rescinded. Um, and, and basically, <laughs> yeah, East, all of Eastern Oklahoma is an Indian reservation now. And that's because Congress didn't take deliberate action to say like this treaty is null and void. And the, the important thing I would mention there is that that in many regards, that's gonna to open the floodgates for a lot of other, um, um, a lot of other uh, court challenges um, coming up. And I think there was one about Herrera versus Wyoming, which was about hunting rights. There's a native guy hunting in, you know, um, forest lands in the state of Wyoming, that land was promised to, you know, to the tribe in treaties, and then he was arrested. And anyways, it got thrown out because, you know, Cong Congress at the end of the day needs to say that these treaties are no longer in effect. But like, there's going to be a lot of cases like that. And I think there's going to be a lot of crazy things that will come out of that. And yeah, I mean, I would say keep that in the radar of just like potential things that will happen. 
Wow. Well, thanks so much, Lynn. There was a lot of really great information. Somebody, uh, the Murdochs want to know when you're coming here next to come. <laughs> and we wish you could have been here in person, but an open invite to come back uh, and visit the Y. And uh, we really appreciate all that you shared with us today. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. All righty. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Len. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much. Thanks, Len. So good. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice.